Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming to today's talk by Leon Atkinson McEwen. The title of today's talk is Conflicting Views of the Palawa People in Early Vandemonian Newspapers, 1824 to 1844. And thank you all for spacing out, making yourself comfortable. If you wish you bought a mask and you didn't bring a mask, I've got a few here, so just put your hand up and I'll come and bring you one around if you would like one. Okay, so Leon is a PhD candidate in the media school at UTAS. His research investigates the journalism of Gilbert Robertson, editor of the Colonist newspaper from 1832 to 1834, and the True Colonist from 1834 to 1844, and the political and social issues he championed. Leon conducts research in modern history at the Tas uh, Tasmanian colonial history, Indian colonial history, and 19th century Chinese history, and ancient history, Greece and Rome. Uh, these series of talks are organised by the Professional Historians of Australia, Victoria, Tasmania branch, and hosted by Libraries Tasmania. And today, for the fourth time, we're offering these talks as a webinar. And we're pleased to join those uh, to welcome those people who are joining us online today. We'll still be continuing to record the talks and make them available on Libraries Tasmania SoundCloud. And you can access this by clicking on the little cloud icon at the bottom of the Libraries Tasmania homepage. And if you've missed any of the other professional historians talks, you can also listen to them on SoundCloud. If you haven't already done so, please switch your phones off now. And Leon has asked that you hold your questions to the end of the talk, at which time he will invite you to um, participate. Now, before I hand you over to Leon, I'd like to read to you Libraries Tasmania's acknowledgement of Tasmania's Aboriginal peoples. We acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal peoples as the traditional custodians of this land, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and future, who hold the memories, traditions, culture and hope of Tasmania's First Peoples. Libraries Tasmania also pays respect to the resilience and strength of the Tasmanian Aboriginal people and extends that respect to all Australian peoples. And please join me in welcoming Leon. Good afternoon. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet here in Nipaluna Hobart in Litruita, Tasmania, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to thank the State Library and Archive Service and the Professional Historian Association of Victoria and Tasmania for the opportunity to speak to you today. And finally, I'd just like to reiterate that my presentation draws on sources that are occasionally highly contrite and which often contain extremely racist views. Now, my presentation today is in two parts. The larger of the two is an examination of the way in which the colonial newspapers of Van Diemen's Land reported on the interactions between the Palawa people and the colonizers in the first two decades of newspaper publishing in the colony. That period, roughly 1824 to 44, is a significant period in the colonial history of Tasmania, coinciding with the so-called Black Wars of the mid to late 1820s, through to the removal of the majority of the Palawa people to Flinders Island, and the steep decline in their population that followed in the 1830s and 1840s. This period is also a highly contested period of history, not the least because of the claims made by Keith Wingshuttle in 2003, when he condemned historians of the period for failing to read newspapers critically. Windshuttle suggested that some historians had misrepresented the Vandemonian press by stating that the settlers had openly expressed their desire to, in his words, extirpate the Palawa people. In Windshuttle's opinion, and I quote, most of the time the press urged caution and humanitarianism when reporting violence between Aborigines and settlers. Now, Wing Shuttle's assertions meant that newspapers became fundamental to claims and then counterclaims about the frontier wars. This presentation uh, on the views and the role of the newspaper of the period is designed to give you some insight into the role played by those newspapers during that highly contested period. 
In the second part of my presentation, I'll take a brief look at newspapers as resources for historians and researchers and offer some brief comments on the joys and pitfalls of using newspapers as those primary sources. First of all, we need a little context. While colonization of Lutruwita began in 803, it was mainly centered around what is now Hobart and Launceston until 1820. Now, this first image shows an approximation of the various parts of the country occupied by the Palo people at colonization. This second image indicates the extent of colonization in 1820 and this one in 1823. And finally, an overlay of the extent of colonization in 1823 over Palo country. As you can see already by 1823, the colonists had joined the southern and northern settlements, had cut through the two halves of the island and encroached to a significant degree on the traditional country in the central and eastern sections of Lutruwita. Obviously, after 1823, the British colonizers moved even further and further into traditional power country and continued to do so, sparking more and more conflicts as they went. Uh, I just want to give you a little bit of context about the newspapers of the period as well. So between 1816 and June 1825, there was only one newspaper in town. That was the Hobart Town Gazette and Southern Reporter. It published government notices alongside various items of news and advertising. It was often merely two pages of, of newsprint. Now, after 1825, there were at least two newspapers in the colony until 1827, when the number rose to three and then four, and then to five by 1831, six in 1832, and then between 1833 and 1844, there were no less than seven newspapers in the colony at any one time, and 10, in fact, in 1841. For a population of around 26,000 colonists and convicts in 1831, and around 40,000 by 1844. So that's a large number of newspapers for a small number of people. And how many of those were actually literate is hard to tell, but going on figures from Britain at the time, it's likely to be no more than 10 to 15%. So what were these newspapers saying about the Palawa people? Well, before 1826, when there was only one newspaper, the coverage of the Palawa people in the Vandemonium press primarily related to clashes between them and settlers. The reporting was generally matter of fact and without the heavily racist depictions and denigrations that became commonplace later. So between 1816 and June 25, uh, the only newspaper, the Hobart Town Gazette, published around a dozen articles about attacks on settlers by the Palawa people, the tone of which while racist, was generally factual, with little embellishment other than the occasional use of phrases such as a savage murder, savage barbarity, a ferocious attack, or the settlers being cruelly murdered. During the same period, the Gazette advocated, and I quote, charity and humanity as the surest path of conducting these much lamented heathens to that fight to which they are present strangers that is, to Christianity. It also published four articles that upbraided the colonists for the behaviour and attitude of their convict stockkeepers towards the Palawa people. So by 1825, the Gazette, which was still the only newspaper, had established three recurring themes within the emerging Vandemonian discourse on the Palawa people. The first, was that they weren't Rousseau's noble savage, nor were they the man and brother portrayed by those ad advocating the abolition of, say, of um, slavery. They were instead miserable savages requiring rescuing, civilizing, and Christianity. These last two, of course, being synonymous. The second theme was that the previously harmless Palawa people had been provoked by the depredations of convict stock keepers and free settlers. And the newspaper made it very clear that the provocations were certainly not as a consequence of the act of colonization itself or the continuing expansion of colonial rule and settlement across the island. 
The lower classes were the ones to blame. The third theme was that it was up to the colonial administration to find a solution. In the face of increasingly hostile interactions between settlers and Palawa people, the discourse encompassed the view that it was governor's, Governor Arthur's responsibility to conciliate the Palawa people, but also at the same time to adopt whatever measures necessary for the preservation of the lives and property of the colonists in the interior of the island. Now, the term conciliate at that period in time was somewhat ambiguous. It had a number of meanings. It could mean to gain goodwill, esteem by acts which soothe, pacify, or induce friendly feeling, or to reconcile to oneself, or to overcome distrust, uh, to come to a position of friendliness, to make things amicable and agreeable, or to win over from a position of distrust and hostility. Exactly what was intended when the newspaper used the word conciliate is unclear. Although it is more likely than not that by conciliating the power of people, it was expected that Arthur should reconcile them to their fate. Now, between 1826 and 1829, attacks on settlers increased and the press reporting changed dramatically. One settler ascribed the escalation in attacks by the Palawa people after 1825 to the hanging of Palawa warriors Mosquito and Blackjack in Hobart in February 25, and Jack and Dick in Hobart in September 1826. <coughs> Obviously, the pressure on traditional hunting areas from encroaching settlements and farms was also an obvious contributory factor. And this was a factor, in fact, that was recognised by Governor Arthur. Now, as a result of these attacks, pressure was applied on Arthur by the majority of the newspapers using the threat of extermination, if he didn't act, to change his policies towards the Palawa people and to remove them by force from Van Diemen's land. In doing so, during this period, the language used was often intemperate, at times histrionic, and very few newspaper articles urged either a cautious or humanitarian approach. The solution in this period was no longer conciliation, it now became removal or extermination. Now, in November 1826, for example, in successive weekly editions of the Gazette, it published articles under the prominent heading, The Black Natives. And it, that employed emotive language far greater than it had been used before. Uh, as well as this change in tone, the first articles began appearing that argued for the removal of the Palawa people to a Bass Strait Island. Terms such as treacherous race, of, treacherous race of human beings, cruel and barbarous murder, atrocities, dreadful ravages, horrid outrages became commonplace. And the colony's other newspaper, the, Co uh, the Colonial Times, threatened Arthur that if the Palawa people were not removed from mainland Tasmania, settlers would take the law into their own hands and exterminate them. Now, these threats were not without substance. The contemporary newspaper editor and early Vandemonian history historian, Henry Melville, reported in 1835 that it was common for parties of the civilised portion, his italics, of the society to scour the bush and falling in with the tracks of the natives during the night to follow them to the place of their encampment where they were slaughtered in cool blood. So by the end of 1826, settler frustration with Arthur's policy and settler ambition for unfettered expansion into those parts of the island still occupied by the Palawa people found voice in the press. In three articles in December 1826, for example, Robert Lathrop Murray, editor of the Colonial Times, argued that nothing short of removal of the Palawa people from mainland Tasmania would prevent further attacks on settlers. He also began to use a series of melodramatic threats against Governor Arthur. In the first article, Murray editorialised thus, we make no display of a pompous display of philanthropy. We say unequivocally, self-defence is the first law of nature. The government must remove the natives. If not, they will be hunted down like wild beasts and destroyed. If they remain here, they are sure to be destroyed. In the second article, in a series of hyperbolic passages, Murray demanded of Arthur, does not the blood of the numerous murdered settlers and servants cry from the earth 
where it has been so barbarously spilled for redress, for retributive justice on those whose hands are imbued in it. He argued that to spare them now is only to reserve them for a greater slaughter, as it is certain that an additional murder will kinder an additional hatred towards them, and the people will kill, destroy, and if possible, exterminate every black in the island, at least as so many as they fall in with. In the third article, Murray reiterated his view that the outcomes could only be exile or destruction. He said, until the Aborigines are sent out of the island, there will be continual slaughter on both sides, which no human hand can possibly prevent, apparently. He also finished a number of his other articles with the refrain, they must be removed, removed, removed. Now, a third newspaper, the Tasmanian, was established in March 1827. It opened up with praise of Governor Arthur, saying that strain of justice and humanity so characteristic of His Excellency, but argued like the Gazette and the Colonial Times that it would, would be better if the Palawa people were removed to an island in Bass Strait. Meanwhile, back in the Colonial Times, Murray continued to raise the spectre of the settlers, and I quote, destroying the black tribes even to utter extermination, unless they were moved to a Bass Strait island he also outlined his view of the reality of colonization. While there might be some justification for the animosity of the Palawa people resulting from their dispossession, he said, power resided with the European colonizers. In his view, the black natives may be sent out of this island to another, as we have before so frequently advised without even a shadow of injustice, considering that they will be deprived of nothing but the country for which they will have another equally answering all the purposes which they now may require. So by 1828, the selection of views expressed in the press, albeit limited to four newspapers at that stage, had coalesced around a single theme. Arthur must act to remove the Palawa people from mainland Tasmania and allow the settlers unfettered access to the entire island or the colonizers would take matters into their own hands. The manner in which it was expressed varied from the resigned and respectful in the Gazette to the melodramatic and threatening, as in the Colonial Times, but the refrain was the same. The Palawa people were brute savages, they said. Their defence of their country was an insupportable obstacle to the colonisation of Van Diemen's land. And if they were not removed, there was a strong threat and the reality of vigilante action by settlers to kill them. Now, Arthur was well aware that his policy of expanding the settled areas of Van Diemen's land was damaging the ability of the Palawa people to sustain themselves, which was in turn leading to an increase in tax on the encroaching settlers. Arthur proposed that for humanitarian reasons, he said, the Palawa people should be resettled in the northeastern quarter of the island and protected, quote, from injuries by the stock keepers a suggestion made without any understanding of Palawa attachment to country or of their way of life, and which still ascribed the source of the conflict to the convict stock keepers and not to the mere fact of colonisation itself. So to achieve this aim, in April 1828, Arthur promulgated an order forbidding Palawa peoples from entering the settled districts unless a previously negotiated passport had been issued. And only for the purposes of travelling through the settled areas the coast for traditional seasonal hunting and gathering. And in advising the colonial office in Britain of his policy, Arthur stated that he was not prepared to adopt harsher measures such as their removal to Bass Strait Island. He said, notwithstanding the clamour and urgent appeals which are now made to me, as I cannot defess myself of the consideration that all aggression originated with the white inhabitants, and that therefore much ought to be endured in return before the blacks are treated as an open and accredited enemy by the government. Now, Arthur didn't specifically refer to the press as the origin of that clamour, but it was certainly one of the sources of public agitation against his policies that uh, made it back to, to Britain. Now, as Arthur's plans to separate the Palawa people from the settlers proved unsuccessful in preventing bloodshed, on either side during 28 and 1829, growing settler dissatisfaction with Arthur was reflected again in the local press. 
Frederick Brown, the editor of the Colonial Advocate, for example, threatened that the Palawa people would be exterminated by the settlers if Arthur's, Arthur's administration did not act to round them up by force of arms and move them to Flinders Island or some other island in Bass Strait. Now, as the so-called Black Wars continued, on the 30th of October, 1828, Arthur issued, Arthur issued a proclamation of martial law. He said the outrages of the savages amounted to a declaration of hostilities, which could only be countered by military operations that would inspire terror. Now, Arthur's actions were praised by James Ross, editor of The Courier, and by John McDougall, editor of The Tasmanian. Although McDougall also editorialised, the Padua people were, and I quote, the real possessors of that land, which it is we who in reality have usurped from them by force and violence. Uh, now, McDougall's humanitarian insight there barely lasted a month because in November 1828, he noted the capture of two chiefs, Mara and Gemini, and said they would willingly enter into a treaty with government, placing them in no worse situation than their present one, especially providing them uh, for them the means of subsistence. Now, McDougall rejected any idea of a treaty that would share the island between the Palawa people and the settlers, and he argued instead that they should use the lure of a treaty to, as an opportunity of collecting together these poor creatures and sending them to King or Kangaroo Island. Now, in October 1830, Murray went so far as to publish a letter in the Colonial Times, sorry, in the Tasmanian, from an anonymous correspondent, suggesting that the best solution to the, and I quote, Aboriginal problem uh, that would prevent their extermination would be to re-establish the slave trade in the colony and encourage the settlers to capture and sell the Palawa people into slavery on Mauritius, quote, to enable them to become useful and happy members of society. That Murray felt comfortable in publishing such a letter gives you an idea of the level to which the settler discourse had descended. Um, as the conflict continued by 1831, the Vandemonian press were berating Arthur for his failed policies, first of cohabitation and then division of the island. And so they argued that there was only, and I used the phrase, deliberately, only one final solution open to him, the total removal of the Palawa people from the island. Now, at that point, Arthur effectively conceded defeat and the removal of the Palawa people to Flinders became official policy. All thoughts of a treaty or separation or some other kind of modus vivendi were abandoned. He publicly expressed the view, and I quote, that the natives of Van Diemen's land had become so dangerous, though diminished to a very small number, that their remaining in their own country was deemed incompatible with the safety of the settlement. Just as the newspapers had portrayed it, the fault now lay with the Palawa people, not the colonists. In October 1831, Arthur reported to the colonial office that the course most likely to prevent the recurrence of similar militaries to those which have been so constantly inflicted on the settlers of the territory was to collect the Palawa people together by every possible kind means and remove them to Flinders Island in Bass Strait, where every endeavour should be made to wean them from their barbarous habits and progressively to introduce civilised customs amongst them. Now, no doubt in deference to the interests that the press reporting had aroused amongst his political masters in London, Arthur had basically adopted the press line in its entirety. Despite the admission that the Palawa people had diminished to a very small number, it was the misery so constantly inflicted on the settlers in this territory, so often graphically and hyperbolically reported in the press that concerned him and not the miseries inflicted on the Palawa people by the colonists or the threats of their extermination. So between 1832 and 1834, the process of collecting, as it was called, the Palawa people together on Flinders Island was undertaken by George Augustus Robinson, the so-called great conciliator, who spent months perambulating Van Diemen's land, conciliating the natives, as he said, 
and then bringing them to a central point for conveyance to Flinders Island. The reaction of the press was almost overwhelmingly positive. The newspapers advertised and supported meetings of settlers in various localities to subscribe a gift, such as silver plate, to Robinson in gratitude for him rounding up the Palawa people and overseeing their removal to Flinders. In April 1835, the editor of The Courier suggested that it should, a subscription should be raised for a grand historical painting of the surviving Palawa people, who the editor described as these poor people, now all but extinct. The painting should have George Augustus Robinson in their midst and should be hung, he argued, in the Supreme Court in Hobart. Now, one editor, Gilbert Robertson of The True Colonist, had a somewhat radical suggestion. Robertson wrote that he would be happy to do everything to promote the subscription, provided the editor of the Courier joined with him in getting as a companion picture what Robertson called a representation of another never to be forgotten portion of the history of these poor people now all but extinct, and more particularly of their conquerors to hand to the white posterity of Van Diemen's Land its exhibition in some public place where it could be frequently seen, as in one of the courts of justice, would commemorate an act of justice that will hardly be credited when recorded in the fatal page of history. But the picture that Robertson wanted to have painted to hand down to posterity as a companion piece would be the awful scene in the Supreme Court when Jack and Dick went through the form of a trial without counsel, without an interpreter, by a law they had never heard, in a language which they could neither speak nor understand. We would have portraits of the judge, the attorney general, and the jury. Also, every lawyer belonging to the bar at a time when not one volunteered to defend the poor savages who had no money to feed them. In the background, we would introduce the material gallows with the miserable dick hoisted up on a stool to have the fatal rope adjusted around his neck. Robertson went further, even more critical. He said, the courier has small occasion to recommend any memento which would hand down to posterity the dark history of the extirpation of the wretched proprietors of the soil, which Britain has seized to plant civilized slavery and the vices of her outcast population in the room of the vices and the freedom of the savage. Robertson was an exception, as you can imagine, to facing up to what had been the recent history of colonization in Van Diemen's land. Now, having achieved their aim of exiling the Palawa people to Flinders, the newspapers of Van Diemen's land, for the most part, entirely lost interest in their fate. From time to time, editors like Gilbert Robertson in The True Colonist, William Goodwin in The Cornwall Chronicle, would censure the administration of the new governor, Sir John Franklin, for the treatment of the Palawa people on Flinders Island and call for an inquiry into their health and into the reasons for their continuing high rates of mortality. The other newspapers in the, in the colony, however, merely grumbled about the cost of the running of the establishment and the deaths on Flinders were generally unremarked. Now, interestingly, the lack of interest about Flinders Island was matched by a growing humanitarian concern, as these editors put it, for the fate of the First Nations peoples on mainland Australia. The concern was strangely inversely proportional to the distance of the ill treatment, or worse murders, of these First Nations people from Van Diemen's land. So attacks on First Nations peoples in Western Australia, South Australia, Queensland and Western New South Wales were condemned but not those in the Port Phillip settlement. There was, of course, a very close connection between Van Diemen's Land and Port Phillip. A large number of settlers there had originally come from Van Diemen's Land or had relatives and friends in Van Diemen's Land. And there had been and continued to be significant investment made by Vandemonian colonists in the new settlement. So it's probably not surprising that there was little press reporting of the massacres that occurred in what is now Victoria. It appears for the most part, Vandemonian editors had no wish to offend those of their readers with connections to Port Phillip 
and so conveniently glossed over the unpleasant aspects of colonial dispossession in that territory. So what do we learn from reading the newspapers of the period? Well, first and foremost, that the interests of the free settlers and particularly the landholding class who owned and edited all but one of the newspapers in Van Diemen's land were clearly represented and reflected in the journalism of the period. As colonization progressed, and particularly from 1826 onwards, when deadly clashes between colonizers and Palawa people significantly increased, the press were hostile to Governor Arthur's policies, first of containment and then of separation. The landed settlers had no interest in anything other than clearing the island of its original inhabitants. And this view was reflected in and amplified by the newspapers of the time. The press presented Arthur with few options. Exile the Palawa people or they will be exterminated. And many had already been hunted down and killed. Keith Windshuttle's critique of the press of the period is clearly wrong. They were not cautious or humanitarian. Most of the press coverage was hostile to the Palawa people and the threats to exterminate them were real and appeared regularly in the press. The second lesson to be drawn is that the press coverage was clearly designed to influence both the domestic colonial readership and the readership in Britain, particularly successive secretaries of state, members of parliament and officials in the colonial office. The lurid reporting of attacks on colonists not matched by any similarly detailed or lurid reporting of the attacks by colonists on the Palawa people, was clearly designed to give the impression in Britain of a heightened threat to the colony. Similarly, the regular threat that the colonists would take matters into their own hands and exterminate the Palawa people was also designed to put pressure on Arthur, domestically as well as back in Britain, to adopt the alternative policy of removal as, as there was no other choice. So to achieve these aims, the press built, consciously or unconsciously, a discourse that dehumanised the Palawa people. They were murderous savages and brutes whose removal and even extermination could be justified to the British public, but whose protection by Arthur at the cost of the lives of the colonists could not be justified. Much of the discourse betrayed them as little more than vermin, as they said whose destruction or transportation to a new environment was of little consequence. Now, while I'm not suggesting that the Vandermanian press deliberately manufactured consent for the near destruction of the power of people, nevertheless, the newspaper editors created and sustained a discourse that gave successive colonial administrations permission to let the destruction occur. In many ways, it's like the media discourse about refugees today, about refugees coming to Australia by boat seeking asylum. If you demonize them long enough and you give them permission for governments to do appalling things in our name. So it was then, so it is now. Well, that concludes the first part of my presentation on the Vandermonian newspapers. And I'd just like to give a little brief look at the issue of how historians use newspapers. So newspapers are obviously very valuable primary sources for historians, particularly now that online newspaper archives and digitization has made accessing and searching newspapers simpler and faster. Apart from the detail they provide about specific events or individuals, Newspapers can be used to illustrate the development of social, cultural, or economic issues. They can also change, chart the changes in focus on or intensity of issues, or the changes in focus on groups of people, like the Palawa people, or even of individuals. They can also demonstrate developments in the way language is used, such as the use of the term conciliate in relation to the Palawa people. What did it mean in 1826? How were they using it? in 1832 and 33, when Robinson was out there conciliating them. Perhaps just as importantly, identifying the omissions and silences of journalists, the things that don't make it into the newspaper, are also useful indicators for historians of the reliability and biases of the journals and of their journalists. 
But in using newspapers as sources, historians need to remember that they were and still are constructed to attract and persuade a readership and that they are heavily informed by editorial agendas. They're also literary texts written at a specific time and place using a set of conventions and discourses designed to attract and persuade their readership. First and foremost, newspapers only include a selection of events from all the possible events that might be reported. So what appears in a newspaper has been through a number of filters that act to exclude matters considered not to be of interest to the readership or which do not sit within the social, economic, political or religious preconceptions or biases of the reporters, editors and proprietors of the newspapers. As a result, newspapers are selective in what in the opinions they, and stories they espouse and in the information they use to convey those opinions and stories. They are not disinterested intermediaries communicating facts and nothing other than facts. There is no such thing as a disinterested journal of record. Secondly, newspapers are commercial entities that combine news and advertisements to attract as large a share possible of the potential pool of readers. They don't only reflect the society in which they are printed, at least as understood by the reporters and editors who write them, but they're written to attract readers by reflecting the ideas, beliefs and prejudices of their readership back to them. Thirdly, newspapers are literary texts. In order to persuade their readers of the truth of the information they convey, journalists organise information into narratives, into stories that lead the reader through a sequence of who, what, when, how and why. They also employ a range of common literary tropes, notably metaphor, hyperbole and allusion to heighten the persuasiveness and attractiveness of the narrative. You only have to look at the current media in Australia to see the differences between the readers being targeted. The readership of the Financial Review is not the target readership of the Mercury or the Herald Sun, except perhaps for the sports pages. Um, now, there can be no doubt that the digitisation of newspapers and online access to searchable newspaper archives has increased the utility of newspapers to historians and media researchers. Prior to digitisation, research into newspapers was both time consuming and resource intensive. Now, digitisation and searchable archives provide the ability to search keywords and key phrases quickly and efficiently. With an immediacy of access that is not dependent on being physically co-located with a microfilm database, a physical newspaper or a newspaper archive. I mean, the, the Trove online database provided by the National Library of Australia, for example, is an excellent database and an excellent example of an online searchable newspaper database available to all. The creation of these newspaper archives has also had a significant effect on how search strategies are conducted and research methodologies are designed. It is something of a truism that searches, and searches can only be framed by the parameters of the search engine and the metadata behind the digitized material. But being a tru truism doesn't mean it's not true. Like, every, like other digital sources, online newspaper archives, by their very nature, influence the type of research that can be conducted. And digitization has its limitations. It's dependent on the type and quality of the software used in the process, as well as on the search power of the software and on any limitations of access. So not all online content is free to browse, for example nor is the content necessarily comprehensive or complete. Pages can be missing from an original issue, an entire edition may have been lost before it could be digitised, and sadly, some of the copies that have been digitised are extremely difficult to read. Moreover, many newspapers haven't been digitised. As a result, the ease of access to those newspapers that have been digitised can lead to a bias towards them over those that are not as easily accessible. Another drawback is that the move to digitization and keyword searching actually distances you as a researcher from the newspaper as a physical object. With microfilm, for example, you scroll through a newspaper constantly looking for what you're trying to find. It reminds you of the physical location and the prominence of each story on the page, which can assist you in understanding the significance of the article for its original readership. 
Digitized word, digitize word searches, on the other hand, like those capable of being conducted through Trove, are great in that they will take you directly to relevant material, but that can be the expense of understanding an article's placement and significant in the, in the newspaper as a whole. Finally, historians need to be aware of the power of search engines themselves. All things being equal with the quality of the search engine and the digitization process, you might be led to assume that a particular search will produce every relevant newspaper article that meets the search query. This isn't always the case. As I have discovered, keywords can be missed because often they'll come at the end of a line, in which case there'll be a hyphen and they'll continue on the next line. And if you don't start searching for all those hyphenated words, you're going to miss them. So fundamental to the use of newspapers, whether in digitized form or not, is the issue of source criticism. By that, I mean evaluating the reliability and credibility of a newspaper as an historical source. Now, in 2009, Stephen Vella proposed a threefold test for evaluating newspapers. First, he said, examine the institutional structure around the newspaper. That is, who controls it? Is it partisan? And if so, in what way? What is its reach? Who advertises in it? And what customer base are they seeking? Secondly, he said, examine the design and layout of the newspaper. Where is the article placed in the newspaper? Which page? What part of the page? What does that tell you about the significance of the article? How is its news content framed in relation to the advertising? Is there a link between news content and the placement of advertisements? Thirdly, he says, examine the content of the news itself. What rhetorical style does the newspaper adopt? At whom is the content directed? Within which discourses does it sit? Does it adopt a position? And does it adopt a position consistently? What constraints, if any, are operating on the text? Is the content given coverage appropriate to its relative significance? How does it compare with the same content in other newspapers? I highly recommend using Villa's tests to determine how much credence can be given to a news item, to a journalist, or an editor, or to a journal itself. Now, in relation to Vandemonian newspapers, Morris Miller's 1953 text, Pressmen and Governors, is often used by historians as a reference guide to the early press in the colony. I would urge everybody to read it with a highly critical eye. Many of the important journalists and editors appear in either appendices or footnotes to the main chapters. And the text is written as a series of sketches. It's not a chronological history, and it is not structured in a particularly helpful or useful way. And the index is not comprehensive. So as a start, you can be misled by just trying to find someone in Miller. Moreover, Miller's views were extremely conservative. To illustrate my point, Miller's ideal journalist was Robert Lathrop Murray, the same Murray who urged Arthur to remove the Padua people to Flinders Island, otherwise settlers would take matters into their own hands and exterminate them. Anyone reading Miller would gain the impression that Murray was an impeccable source on what was happening in Van Diemen's Land from 1825 to 1844. Unfortunately, on many issues, Murray's biases appear to have been Miller's biases as well. And like Murray, Miller was highly critical and often dismissive of those Vendemonian journalists who held colonial administrations to account. He didn't like radicals. In forming a view of the credibility of newspaper sources in the early colonial period, Miller is a guide, but not gospel truth. In evaluating Vendemonian newspapers as historical sources, you have to read far more widely than just Miller. Okay, almost finished. I'd just like to leave you with this quote from George Orwell from the preface to his novella, Animal Farm. Now, just so you're aware, the British Ministry of Information forced Orwell's publisher to suppress this preface when the novella was first published in 1945, which may well have given Orwell impetus if any was needed to write his masterpiece, 1984. So, most daily newspapers are owned by wealthy men who have every motive to be dishonest on certain important topics. Always ever thus.
Thank you very much. Happy to take your questions. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for your um, presentation and particularly your analysis of the way that historians use these papers. I'd like to go back to the beginning of your paper sure. when you talk about the early reports um, were largely factual. Mm. And I wonder how you know that. Well, because they, co they, they correlate to what was being um, reported through the um, dispatches of governors back to the colonial office. And so they would say uh, three settlers attacked in New Norfolk. And that would be reported back. And in the newspapers, they'd say three quarters were three settlers were attacked in New Norfolk. So they were factual. With the only the occasion. Yeah, consistent with other sources. Yes, so yes, but they they obviously over time started to add extra adjectives into the into the narrative to um, well, not spice it up, but to to make it more lurid. Quite frankly, yeah. Thank you. Yes. For the people who took the the opposite view, uh, had a, a great a, a more of an understanding of the abstract and what was happening. Uh, occasionally, um, they would get um, letters into the newspapers, but given that the newspapers had a particular slant, um, critical letters critical of the treatment of the Palawa people are few and very far between. And it really isn't until you start seeing Gilbert Robertson in the col in the colonists and the true colonists and Goodwin in the the um, Cornwall Chronicle that you start seeing an alternative view. By which time, the Black Wars are more or less over, and Robinson is out there conciliating them and then taking them off to Flinders Island. So that earlier period from 1826 to around 1831-32, it's almost invariably wall-to-wall -wall hostility. Yes. Where do you place Henry Melville? That, uh... Well, see, Melville's an interesting one. He owned three newspapers, one of which was critical of Governor Arthur, one of which sat on the fence, and one of which was um, pro-Governor Arthur. <laughs> I mean, he was an astute businessman in that sense, but um, as a newspaper proprietor, he was happy to um, have the uh, broadest possible um, newspaper coverage. Um, but in his own history of Van, Van Diemen's Land, that which I quoted from, he was far more critical. That criticism doesn't occur in his newspapers, except criticism of Arthur for being incompetent, for example. So when they started the um, the black line from but well, basically the sweep across the state down towards Port Arthur. Melville was highly critical of, of Arthur, not for the attempt of trying to round the Palawa people up, but rather for his ignorance of the country, the steepness and the impossibility of maintaining uh, a line of, of settlers and soldiers through that vast sweep of country. So politically, Melville kept his um, his personal um, opinions basically to himself until he wrote that in 1835 after being jailed by Arthur, sorry, jailed by the Supreme Court for contempt and Arthur refused to let him let him out. So he had a bit of a, a grudge to a degree. Yes. Um, I was curious about the ancient um, Palawa people's Sadly, you have to read them. <laughs> you have to read the newspapers and correlate them with what other is 
um, reporting is going on through dispatches or whatever else. But yes, you have to read. Reading them gives you a greater familiarity with the kinds of keywords you can search on. But until yeah, but until until you do the reading, particularly early on, um, you know, three key words early on: Aborigines, blacks, natives became savages very quickly after about 1825. And other words like vermin um, started to appear as well. And yeah, you, you literally got to read the articles to get a sense um, of what, you know, what's possible and what's not. Yes. Um, I think that to add to that useful list you've given us of reasons why we should be cautious about newspapers, in, especially in the colonial period. You'd have to add, especially in Hobart, but also even in Sydney in the 1930, 1930s, the enmities and, and the disagreements between the editors and proprietors themselves. Oh, yes. And Robertson and Abbott and the other editors in Hobart were particularly liable for that. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, um, what Robertson or McDougall or Abbott says about Abbott, McDougall or Robertson, you take with a very large grain of salt. What they might say about what was said at a public meeting or something else, you can often correlate between two or three newspapers and get a reasonable approximation. Although Robertson, for example, was a great one to stand up and, and provide you know, a half hour's alternative view on what the settlers should do. And he's probably the only one who actually reported what he said. Everybody else said, yes, Robertson stood up, babbled on and then sat down again. <laughs> Hmm. Um, the, the newspapers make their money from advertising, and to what extent did that then influence them? They did. Um, when you read the newspapers, a lot of the advertising is quite amusing. Um, it's either uh, things like um, houses for sale, is a surprise, um, <laughs> land for sale, uh, or um, grain and wheat prices and who's got the best prices and you know, where you can either buy or sell, um, or things like um, for many of the newspapers, at least two or three columns on the back pages were horses or bulls at stud um, because they were very much focused on an agricultural um, economy for certainly in the early days. Uh, and so it had a, a strong agricultural and import-export focus. How much that in influenced is difficult to say. Um, certainly, newspaper editors would often accuse rival newspaper editors of being influenced by a commercial issue, of which they often had a very large investment. Um, and uh, the, the, the advertisements are um, generally small uh, and uh, you know, placed at either the front or the, the, the back page of the newspaper and tend to be the sorts of commercial type uh, advertisements you'd expect to see in a growing agricultural and um, a sealing fishing colony. Um, going back to you, uh, how you were saying that uh, literacy was at a fairly low level when we're talking about uh, what was 15 to 20 percent of people could actually yes, read the papers if they had. So we're talking about 80 percent of the population here that didn't, and so therefore, well, oh, well uh, to a limit. We'll put it this way. Uh, Governor Arthur was concerned by newspapers because he always thought that there'd be at least one literate convict amongst many who would read the newspapers to the others and give them a false, you know, that dreadful newspaper reporting about how incompetent he was or how evil and nasty he was would be circulated amongst the convicts. So whilst literacy levels were probably quite low, as they were in Britain at the time, that didn't mean that newspapers weren't circulated and, and, and read to family groups Read one of the things that Arthur did object to was settlers reading um, the newspapers to their convict servants. So, yeah, there, there was probably a larger like circulation of the ideas in the newspaper than the literacy, literacy levels would certainly indicate. Okay. 
Um, so where I was going with that was that how can you evaluate the views of the um, of the non-regents, basically the, the illiterate? How can you? How, is there any? There is no way to evaluate that. No. So we're literally, literally only getting the views of those of the upper class or the middle class who could read. So. Yes. And the Herald Sun and the Mercury and the Australian, all the news, yeah, the news limited stock and the um, Fairfax Nine newspapers are no different. Mm -hmm. They are they are the voices of the elite. And um, in Van Diemen's Land, there was really only one or two at times independent news proprietors who weren't in one way, shape, or form aligned with the government. The administrations of Arthur or Franklin, or aligned with particular factions within the colonial administration. Um, so yes, you are getting the ideas of the elite, but they were the people who had power and sway back in Britain as well. They had connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking just at the accuracy of how life was at the time, not specifically with this. Oh, to that you would go. You would go to you know, letters and diaries and that to get a yeah. Yeah. Have you had a look at the newspaper that was published by the Aboriginal community? Yes, on, on Flinders, yes. Yes, yes. And that gives you a very good un understanding of at least how they felt about their exile. Um, and uh, sadly, I could find no mention in any of the newspapers that I've gone through of um, any kind of knowledge about that newspaper on Flinders. There was very little. One of the, one of the things was, A, it was out of bounds, so to speak. B, um, uh, people like Robertson, for example, in Hobart, didn't have the wherewithal to get to, to Flinders, even if he wanted to. Uh, neither could um, uh, Goodwin in, in, in Launceston either. He didn't have the wherewithal to get there. So it was very much a bit like dare I say it, Manus or Christmas Island. Um, what came out of there were government reports and nothing much else. And uh, but certainly there were reports coming out of the deaths and the and the, the disease that was occurring there. But um, as I said, very little interest by the um, colonial uh, editors in that uh, in that story. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.